Welcome to this fourth session of the Diwan of Sorbonne Abu Dhabi and CFAS. It's the fourth session, but it's only the second online session in a webinar format. And it is today my great pleasure to welcome here Professor David Wilson, who heads the Department of Arabic and Translation Studies at the American University of Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates. Professor Wilmson is a distinguished Arabist, linguist, and dialectologist. He has previously taught linguistics and translation at the American University in Cairo, Georgetown University, and the American University of Beirut. His research uh, interests encom encompass the history of the Arabic dialects, especially their ancient grammatical features that survive in the original varieties of modern spoken Arabic, which will be one of the topics examined in today's conference. Professor Wilmson has studied and published research on Maltese Arabic, Lebanese Arabic in its Kisirwan variety, focusing on morphosyntactic elements of these dialects. Gulf dialectology is certainly, is certainly not as developed as this of Egypt or the Levant or Morocco, and we do not have a linguistic atlas of the region presenting its various isoglosses yet, but thanks to the pioneering efforts of such researchers as Bruce Engham, Clive Holes, uh, Marcel Kubershuk, uh, Hamdi Kafishi, Janet Watson, Nizar Habash, and many others, the modern dialects of the Arabian Peninsula and the Gulf region are now better known. The various dialects of the UAE, however, until recently might not have been so lucky as Kuwaiti, uh, Omani, or Bahraini var uh, variants of Arabic. This seems, however, to be moving fast as a new grammar of Emirati authored by Mir al Kabi, Dimitrios and Telefeos, and Tommy Chung will be published by Rutledge at the end of this month. Professor Wilmsen has had the wonderful opportunity to work on a precious corpus, that of the Charja Museum Authority, an ensemble of authentic recordings of old Sharjah port area dwellers that show what maybe, he will explain this to us, pre coinization features that, miracle, that miraculously were documented via these oral testimonies. So we are delighted to welcome him at the Diwan and hear him now presenting singular features of Emirati dialects using the Sharjah Museum's authority recordings as a data source. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, work the miracle of electronics here and share my screen. And for some reason, when I share it, you can see it, but I can't. Oh, no, I can't. now I can see it. That's great. You can all see this then? Good. All right, so here is the, um, the title of the talk, which uh, Frederic already uh, gave to us, so we'll, we won't stay here. How do I change? How do I change my screen? Oh, I see, I see, there's this arrow down here, good. Yeah, good, we're at it now. All right, so this is where we're situated, just so we all know. And you'll notice that I use that as a background on a lot of the slides, like the beginning one. Actually, I started this when um, giving talks about Emirati Arabic abroad and talking about Sharjah because everybody knows where Dubai is, but nobody knows where Sharjah is, <clears throat> unfortunately. Well, people do, but some people don't. And so I always put this up to show everyone where we are. Now, as Frederic was saying, there is, have, has been very little work done with the dialects of the Emirates, um, one of the earliest works was by Timothy Johnstone in his famous book, Eastern Arabic Dialect Studies. And he actually mentions the feature that I um, came to the Emirates to study. I came to the Emirates for other reasons too, but one of the major reasons was I had developed an interest in what I co was calling and will still call existential shay or shay or she, but there it does other things which we'll see so it's more than just an existential. And he mentions it in one place, and it appears also in <clears throat> at least once in the, his texts. I don't remember, maybe more than once. But uh, there has not been even much talk about that, although it has been documented in a few dialects of the entire region. Um, 
we also have Hamd Qafishe, who has written a short reference grammar of Gulf Arabic. Now it's really a short reference grammar of Abu Dhabi Arabic. The, most of his work is done on the, uh, the dialect of, was collected in, the, in uh, Abu Dhabi and he mentions that, although he claims to also speak for Bahrain and Kuwait as well, but it's really an Abu Dhabi dialect. So I would rather that he had called this a short reference grammar of Abu Dhabi Arabic or Emirati Arabic. Uh, that, as you can see, uh, we have uh, some work done in 1967, a complete reference grammar in 1979, although Afishe does not mention anything about grammatical or uh, existential she. And I think it may be, not in this particular case, but I've noticed in his work that there are things that I either dis disagree with or I would think there might be dialect differences. He was my first professor of Arabic, by the way, and the first Arabic of any kind I studied was uh, in his book, um, uh, what's it called? It's right over there. A basic course in Gulf Arabic. But now I know a lot more than I did then about Arabic, and sometimes I disagree with him. We also have this book that was, it was a dissertation published by Rosina Fauzia Rawi, uh, who did this and then didn't do anything else with linguistics at all. She went to work for uh, Ministry of Agriculture in Jerusalem. She's from uh, in Iraq to begin with. And now she's in fact a life coach of some sort. And I just happen to be looking at her webpage. She's got one if you want to go see her. And she's not doing anything about uh, Arabic at all. She's more into spirituality and that sort of thing. But you notice that she did her um, her work on the dialect of Abu Dhabi as well. There, now I have a laser pointer. Now, I'm happy to say that there are, as there's a young younger generation of Arabists and dialectologists who are now paying attention to the dialects of the Gulf. Uh, I just happen, one, one of them is Najla Kalash, who happens to be with us today. I invited her and I noticed that she's here. So I'm happy that she's here. And I was talking to another one or uh, emailing with another one a few days ago, um, who's working on her master's degree in Emirati Arabic. So I'm entirely pleased to have to find a new generation of Arabists who are actually interested in the dialects of the Gulf. And Najla is also working on uh, things that are closer to home. You see that she has done something with the dialect, the Emirate of Dubai, but she's also now working on a, a text from Dubai and Ajman and Sharjah, which is really exciting. And I can't wait to see what she comes up with in that. All right, so what I'm calling this then is what Najla and I are working on. We have plans to work together, but we've been working individually so far. And I'm calling this Northern Emirati Arabic. And there are differences between uh, the dialect of Abu Dhabi and the dialect of the Northern Emirates. We, they won't really concern us much today, but they are, there are definitely differences. And there are things that I've noticed in my old textbook, which I've now taught out of a little bit also that I've actually confirmed are not mistakes of my old professor, and they're not uh, changes from 1979 until today, but they are in fact dialect differences between the dialect of Abu Dhabi and the dialects of nor the Northern Emirates. All right, so as I said, I first came to the Emirates for several reasons, but I had specifically in mind to research this particular um, grammatical feature of the dialects. And since working with the texts of uh, the Sharjah Museums Authority, which I'll get into in just a minute, I, and, uh, I also came across this thing that we'll see in a few minutes, but it's what's called oftentimes an infixed noon, and there's another name for it, but I can't remember what it is right now, which I had already known about before I got here, but I found evidence of it in the uh, in the text that I was working with, and then something that I did not expect, <coughs> which is the word aku, which is used in Iraqi dialect as a 
an existential particle, which I'll explain in a few minutes. Now, what I intend to do actually is not address them in the order that I came to study them, but in the reverse order, because I'm still involved in studying echo. And um, I've just recently completed a study of the infixed noon, which I've sent off for, well, I presented it at the last IDA conferences. And they may be public, it may be published eventually. And then I'll get into the existential Shea, which I've spent years studying. And when I was prefer preparing this talk, in fact, I, I, I thought, all right, I'll, we'll run through the echo and noon pretty quickly, which I did do. And then when I got to that, it took me days to be able to figure out what I was going to say about it, because there's so much to say. So it was the hardest thing to, hardest part of the talk to prepare. But I think I've made it simple enough for people who aren't specialists in linguistics. All right, so let's have a look at where we are. Here's the United Arab Emirates in context, right in the Gulf. And the Gulf, of course, extends from Shat al-Arab all the way to Hormuz. And then after that, we have the Gulf of Oman. So this is the Arabian Gulf. And when we talk about Gulf dialects, that's what we're talking about. Omani dialects are considered to be a different dialect grouping, although there are um, similarities between some of the, the dialects of the Emirates and some of the dialects of Bahrain. And in fact, the dialects that the, the, the dialects in these areas that are color, covered in green look to be the remnants of an old dialect area, which uh, Clive Holes, who has probably done more about Gulf Arabic than anyone else living and anyone else before him also. And he calls this a broken chain of dialects. And he says they run around the coast from Bahrain all the way to Western Hadramaut, but he also dialects features of the same dialect that are Western Hadramaut would be right about here, right about there. But he dial uh, uh, documents these features all the way to here. And the ones I'm talking about have also been docu documented here. So this is a chain of dialects that runs from southern Yemen all the way through Bahrain and in the eastern provinces of uh, Saudi Arabia. Now let's talk about the text a bit. <clears throat> Um, I was extraordinarily fortunate to be involved with the uh, Sharjah Museum's authority, and it all came about through a, well, a series of meetings with the authority, but uh, eventually the, um, we, the, the Sharjah Museum's authority and my department at the American University in Sharjah uh, hosted a conference together. And in the planning stages of that, one of the, the, um, personnel of the Sharjah Museum's Authority happened to tell me, while we were talking about what, thing, what we would do with the conferees and we would take them on field trips and we would uh, show them some of the museums. And she said, and the, my contact, one of my contacts said, oh, and we have a series of, of folk histories and I could have someone talk about that. And I said, I want to hear them. And uh, so then I had to fill out a form to get access and I was given access to the recordings and a set of transcriptions. All of the, almost all of the recordings have been transcri transcribed into Arabic. And uh, I have copies of the transcriptions, but the recordings themselves are housed at the authority. The, the, for various reasons, they did not want them to leave the authority. So I spent a, a very pleasant year every Thursday going to the library at the main headquarters of the Sharjah Museum's authority and poring over these tapes and their, their transcripts and making notes to myself. And the, the occasion of this talk has given me a chance to go back over them again. Everything sort of came to a standstill right about the time of the pandemic. But I had pretty much gone through all the recordings by that time. But going, just going back through the transcriptions is a wonderful, has been a wonderful idea. Now, we have a picture of what's going on here. It's called the Hessen Redisplay Project. And I'll tell you why it's called that in a minute. This is Old Town Sharjah that we're looking at a view of, and this actually is a photo from their website. And these are a couple more photos from their websites, and you can see that we get a, a feeling of what, the, what it might have been like uh, to live in uh, um, 
old town Sharjah. This, as you can see, is completely restored and it's actually the backside of a hotel. I think it's the backside of a hotel, but it still preserves some of the, some of the, uh, the, um, the atmosphere of the old city. And it's called uh, Al Hassan Redisplay Project because the story goes that when the Sheikh um, uh, Sultan bin Mohammed Al Qasimi, who, mashallah, alayhi, has two doctorates, and when he was away studying for his doctorate, apparently they began to take the, the, the old fort down. And when he came back, uh, completed with his doctorate, and one of them is in history, so, you know, he's quite interested in the history of, of this area. He said, no, no, we cannot have that. We'll have to rebuild it. Uh, but in order to rebuild it, they had to find out things about where, where buildings had been placed because it was, it was an old town that had been neglected for a while. And the idea then was to uh, talk to people who lived in old town Sharjah to find out where their houses were and where their neighbors were and what other things were happening. That one of the, one of the, the, uh, the recordings, for instance, goes on for a long time discussing the wall and where the, 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 each tower was on the walls. And you can see here, we have the walls. This is an overview of Old Town Sharjah. We have the walls rebuilt. Some of them were there, but you know, they were largely rebuilt. Here is Al Hassan. So it's right outside the, what is now Old Town Sharjah what they call the heart of Sharjah or Galb al Sharjah. Uh, and then we have buildings here that have been, some of them were standing and some of them have been reconstructed. This is an old market. And that hotel we saw is also as a part of this market. It's now open for business, in fact. And there's a series of markets that go through here. And then this is a Sharjah Museum's Authority building. This is the Museum of uh, Sharjah Museum of Art, and all of these buildings are will be look, maybe not that that looks like it might be a mosque, but all of the buildings that you can see there, you can see a few of them in this picture. These buildings will all be um, torn down except for that one apparently. That one won't be. Um, one of the Sharjah Museum's personnel was lamenting that to me, but I rather like this building. But it would be nice to have all these other buildings down. And I'm just reading in the paper recently that all the owners and the shop owner, owners of apartments and shop owners of this area will be con uh, compensated handsomely. All right, now the recordings themselves involve uh, eight men, which uh, uh, constitute about 12.5 hours of recording. And there were three women involved who, for reasons of privacy, I have not heard their recordings but I, they, we do have transcripts of them, which I have access to. And judging by the, um, the number of pages uh, of transcripts, I estimate that there are about eight hours of, of recording or interviews with the women as well. And this all amounts, all of them together amount to 354 pages of transcriptions, 116 of which are the women. This is a huge and wonderful resource. And to find the thing is like finding gold for a dialectologist. And with that, I must give my thanks to the Sharjah Museum's authority in general, but also some specific individuals thereof. First of all, Manel Altaya, who was the director general of the Sharjah Museum's authority. Fatma al-Muhayri was at the time that the recordings or the, the, the oral histories were constructed, she was a researcher and actually the lead researcher of the project. And she did a thoroughly excellent job. She was very young at the time, she's still young, but she was even younger then. And it's, ju it's just phenomenal to find such professional work by, by such a young researcher. And she's now the director of research at Sharjah Museum's Authority and she deserves it. Alia Borhema was the is the education and interpretation manager at the, the authority. And my thanks go to all of them and everyone else there because they're all just wonderful people. And then my two graduate research assistants, Amna Saleh, who is a native of Sharjah, and Buthayna Hamoud, who is a native of the Eastern provinces of Saudi Arabia. And they've helped me with the transcriptions. All right, so let's get into the language itself and the features of the language that I found interesting. Now, first of all, let me explain uh, existentials because when you hear existential, oftentimes you think of Jean-Paul Sartre or someone like that. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about when you say 
in English, there is such and such. And there are at least six different existential particles that are used in Arabic dialect. And there may be more, but at least the main uh, dialects have these. So Iraqi Arabic and also uh, Kuwaiti have aku. And here's an example of it. Aku panad be madrasitkum. Or it's a question, are there girls in your school? Yemeni Arabic has several, but one of them is B. B nasi shil al gild. Syrian Arabic and other Arabics also combined have this very famous one, fi. So here's one. This is actually is a researcher who's at Sharjah University. Fi itta taht al kursi. Moroccan Arabic has kayan, kayan wahad salugi lil biya tamma. Tunisian Arabic has thamma and sometimes femma, and this becomes m in Maltese, by the way. And one of, my, one of my students who's from Mauritania just the other day told me that in Mauritania they also have femma. And Emirati Arabic, one of my students is also Emirati, and she was volunteering this. She's from Fujairah. Emirati Arabic has she. It's also pronounced she and also pronounced she and, and uh, various ways as well. And this here, this particular phrase, Shea Internet or Free Wi-Fi, was given to me or said to me by uh, one of the personnel from the Sharjah Museums Authority when we were talking about the kinds of, of uh, resources that would be available to students at, um, if they visit uh, the Sharjah Museums, any of the Sharjah Museums or, any, or their libraries even. Um, and I was just thrilled when it was said to me. All right, so while I'm working through these recordings, or not, uh, well, the recordings and the transcripts, I came across this particular phrase right here. This is the first one I came across. And I thought, oh my goodness. Here's another, another existential particle that it should be, or has been said to be uh, uh, per, uh, uh, a, a feature of Kuwaiti and, and Iraqi Arabic. And Clive Hall says it's used somewhat in Bahrain as well. And then I started finding it also, this one here, and he goes on to say, Atfal who has drunk Pepsi and, and, and cocoa. So he's blaming Pepsi and cocoa for their hospital visits, although I'm not sure that's what's happening, but it's, we're interested in the, the language, not in the truth of what he's saying. Now this looks like it's probably feminine, and it could be with Mustashfayet and al Rog and even Atfal, but you also, we also find this. Sorry. But what I see is, when I first saw this, I thought, my goodness, it's an ex existential particle. But then looking at it, I found that it probably is more of what we call a presentative. And a presentative is not there is, but there it is. I'll give you a few more examples. Here we go. Aku maktub asamihum kulluhum taht. There it is. All their names are written below. Wa qala aki aki asak. This is clearly clearly a presentative. Here is your stick. You know, a walking stick or something like that. So then that made me reconsider whether when I first came across these, whether what is being said is a presentative or an existential, and I'm not sure yet, uh, and I'm going to be researching this more. This is something that I'm still researching. Uh, and I may be presenting this at the next IDA, the re re also my, uh, results of my research at the next IDA meeting. Um, so I don't want to go on with it more for that reason too, but there's not much more I can say about it anyway, except this. It has been attested in Yemen uh, with singulars and plurals. It's only attested in the ma masculine in Iraq and Kuwait, and as far as I know in Bahrain as well. The supposition then is that there are two different, there are two different proposals for where this may be uh, derived from. The earliest one is by Otto Yastrov, who says that it must come from the verb to be. But if we take the Yemeni uh, 
constructions into account, it looks like it might actually be a demonstrative and presentative construction with the pronoun huwa, wahiya, and etc. Meaning there it is. And that's what, in fact, what uh, Werner Diem, who's, who, who's research, researched this, has said. And in favor of that hypothesis is that we find a Klein leading from Yemen through the Emirates now and into uh, Bahrain and actually further on to Kuwait and, uh, and Iraq. Now, Kofiche has actually uh, attested these. Haku, Hakhom, Haki, Haki. And my students also tell me that that exists. I'm looking for more of this, and I found a, a few more examples of this, and a few more examples of Aku, Aki. In Bahrain, we have Aku with no feminine and no plurals, but we also have this, Hakhu, 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 Wahaki, Wahaki. So there is a feminine with the ha. And in Iraq only, Aku, Iraq, Iraq and Kuwait. So my thesis is going to be eventually when I research this more, and we have my own findings now. I don't, as far as I know, nobody has ever attested this before, but they're well attested in the Sharjah Museum's uh, uh, transcriptions. And when you see the Arabic written, you, you see, you're seeing something that I've just lifted from the transcription and put it onto the page, onto the, the slide, because the transcriptions are fortunately transcribed into Microsoft Word. All right, let's look at the infixed noon. Let me explain first what's happening here. In Arabic dialects throughout the entire Arabic world and extending beyond what we would call the Arabophone world into as far as the Arabic dialects of Khorasan and some of the Arabic dialects in uh, Chad and, and uh, Nigeria and Lower Sudan, there are various ways of affixing an object pronoun to the, uh, the, the, the um, the participle. So in Kyrene Arabic, if you want to, I'm going to do this, give in the examples uh, feminine forms because they they show a little bit easier that way. Shayfa, meaning I've seen him. And in Levantine Arabic and other Arabics, you get Shayfitu, meaning I've seen him, if you're a woman saying this, or if you're saying it about a woman, or if there's, if the person involved is a woman. In, uh, Omani in Emirati in Yemeni Arabic, we get Shefatinna. And it's only in this part of the, the Arabophone world where we find that. And we find examples of that. Uh, these, and this is not something that I myself have discovered by myself. Uh, the other people have talked about it. Holes have his complete article about it in 2011. Uh, he, he discusses it to, in some detail in his 2016 work and in less, somewhat less detail in his 2018 work. Arawi mentions it, but doesn't do much with it. Kafiche mentions it, and I'll show you what he says about it in a minute. For the UAE, Reinhardt uh, in 1894 has mentioned it, uh, but without doing much about it. And Holes has mentioned it for Oman also in his 2016 work. And Landberg has uh, documented it in Yemeni Arabic. And Jonathan, Jonathan Owens has an entire article about it, not for any particular uh, uh, dialect of Arabic, but a, sort of an overarching view of it. This is what Kofiche says. There are two forms of active participle plus pro suffix pronoun, one without and the other with, the ending in before the suffix pronoun. And that turns out to be important for us. Holes has this to say about it, and he, you could say this about Emirati Arabic in general. Unfortunately, we still have no comprehensive dialect, dialectological, dialect, how do you say this? Dialectological study of the Emirates. Or he says, whoops, the situation in the UAE is currently unclear. Now he's talking about the infix noon itself, uh, but that could be true of a lot of other things about the Emirati dialects. And I've actually corresponded with him about this particular feature while I was studying it. And it turns out that what he's found about the, and everyone else has found about the infix noon in other dialects also applies in the Emirates, but there's one uh, difference that I'll point out in a minute. 
So here is the first one I found. Um, uh, someone talking to Fatma al Bahari, and he says, Shave Fina Tal Omrich, Tal Omrish, sorry, the Senate, the name, Khamsin. So there it is, right there. Shave Fina. Meaning, I saw it, they're talking about a book that, uh, that uh, one of the Al Qawasim had written. It's not, it was an old book, so it wasn't. Um, Al Sheikh uh, Dr. Sultan bin Muhammad Al Qasmi, one of his ancestors. Um, this is from one of the women, uh, so I haven't heard her say it, but I found it in the transcriptions. Yom endi shame sawatinna. We have when I have something that I made it, and then she says I send it off. Now this is something that I've heard. This is so I don't have the Arabic written here, just the transliteration. El Walda, and this is something that no one has noticed before. The noon trans uh, um, uh, assimilates to the lamb if there is a dative lamb afterwards. So El Walda musawatilek riyug. Mother's made breakfast for you. Now, when we get to Abu Dhabi, we find that you might have it without, as Qafishe says, Mehtajich, Mektabi Mehtajich. My office needs you. I should say about Abu Dhabi, I only get to Abu Dhabi very, very, uh, very rarely, and when I do, I go to visit my brother in law, so I don't, uh, who's uh, Jordanian, so I don't actually get to hear a lot of Abu Dhabi dialect, except that I have the radio on when I'm driving there and when I drive back. So this is actually, this particular example is taken from a musalsal that is on Netflix. It's called in English, Justice. And in Arabic, it's called Galb uh, al-Adela. So if you want to go hear it, you can hear it. It's in one of the er early episodes. I think there are only eight episodes. And it's about a lawyer whose daughter graduates and becomes a lawyer and, and uh, he wants her to work in his office. So that's what was going on there. She's having trouble and she says, or his mother says, his mother, her mother says to her father, he So we find that it may appear in Abu Dhabi, just as Kofiche says. And she says to her father the same thing. All right, so, but what I have found is this in my observations the observations uh, extraneous to the Sharjah Museum's transcriptions is that you never hear it in the Northern Arabic, uh, Northern Emirati Arabic without the infix noon. But you do find it in the Abu Dhabi dialect with or without the uh, infix noon, just as Khafisha had said. Also, no one has ever noticed this, that there is assimilation. So the two orange ones are things that I have actually found. Um, and I say you never hear it, but I have heard while in the Northern Arabic, uh, Northern Emirates, uh, on I think two occasions, someone using it without the infix noon. But the thing was, I couldn't tell where those people were from, and they may not have been Northern Emir uh, native Northern Emirati speakers. So I'm going to say that uh, almost invariably in Northern Emir in Emirati Arabic, the infix noon is there between the, uh, uh, the uh, active participle and its object. Now, Holes in his 2018 work has actually charted these, and you'll see where they, where they have been documented or where he has documented them. These are all his own documentation. These are where other people have documented them. And you'll see that what that does, is that fits exactly with this broken chain of dialects that Holes talks about. All right, let's get on to existential Shay, and I think that we're going to actually have enough time for some discussion as well. I'll remind you what existential pred predication is. We don't need to go through it again, except that now we have this in red, because this is what we're going to look at. And this is a <coughs> thoroughly unusual, because all of these others, we might say that we can, we can guess where they come from, and they all come from Arabic. There's a, a bit of a discussion about whether it's uh, Aku comes from Hakhoa or whether it comes from Yakun, but otherwise we can say that all of these are quite familiar and we can guess at how they developed as, as uh, 
uh, existential particles. Bi and fi, for instance, almost surely come from bihi wa fihi, in it. And kayan is obviously kayan, meaning being. The Tunisian thamma, we know this one, this exists in written Arabic as well. And it comes from a demonstrative meaning there. There's a bit of debate about this amongst Semiticists, but there is clear uh, attestation of a, a thamma meaning there in, in uh, Yemeni Arabic in the work of Peter Bainstead. There's a question about Shay. Where could this come from? And the default has always seemed to be, although there has not been much discussion of existential Shay uh, um, in amongst Arabic dialect, dialectologists until I came along, and a lot of people still disagree with me, but I think I may have found reasons to, which we'll talk about uh, at the end of the talk, reasons to show that this must, this must be where it comes from, but it may not be the word for thing, although there is certainly a word for thing of the same shape in many Arabic dialects, although not all, and in, in Fosha as well. So, there should be a slide here where I, let me go back. If it goes back, yeah, there it is. Yes, I am going to argue that it come, actually, that Aku comes from Hakhowa. So that means the only thing we don't know where it comes from is She, and we may uh, have found that out too. Now there are attestations of Shea uh, also in the same works, almost the same works as we've seen before. Holes has discussed it uh, to a great de degree in his 2016 work, and he discusses a little bit in 2018. John Stone mentions it, as I say, once. And maybe uh, in his text too, there's one, one example of it at least. Reinhardt gives some examples of it. <coughs> Holes, when he's talking about the uh, whole bundle of features in that broken chain of dialects, he discusses Shea and uh, among many other things. And there is now another young researcher, I'm happy to say, who is going back and examining Reinhardt's attestations of Shea, and she's doing research uh, field work, or she's done field work in the same areas of uh, dialect areas that Reinhardt covered, although the, the value there is that she's actually been to the dialect areas. Reinhardt had a speaker from that area whom he was uh, um, interviewing while in Germany, I believe. And Landberg has a few uh, citations of it as well. But there has never been much of, a, of an examination of what goes on with it. So now we're going to do it. So it means there is, actually. And here's a bit from the, uh, from the transcriptions. Awul ma shay maqahi, shay maylis. Awul in this in this dialect it can refer to the old days, so that's how I've translated. In the old days, there were no coffee houses. There was a majlis. I was looking up to see if majlis actually exists in English, and I'm almost sure it does, but I couldn't find it defined in a in a, a dictionary. But it means a uh, a meeting room. Nowadays, almost every house has one, so it's a place where you go and sit. Apparently, in Old Town Sharjah, there was one, and it probably was in the house of the sheikh. Notice the negation. It's regular negation, ma she or ma she. There are various ways it's pronounced. This has uh, traveled all the way to Morocco, and it's not an existential in Moroccan Arabic. It's a, an uh, attributive negator, ma she henna. He's not here, for instance. Um, all right, here's another example that I wanted to show you because we have this also. Hey. Fi, or hai fi, fi, like in ghanam mashe, or mashi. Now what this shows is that uh, she is not the only existential particle that we find in the Emirates. And in fact, there has been some talk uh, by um, Holes and other people who've examined it a bit, that uh, she, she or she, and it's, ver it's a reflexes, is probably the older form and it's passing out of use because uh, because the uh, fee is being used now. And that may be because of the influx of speakers of Egyptian Arabic and Levantine Arabic uh, who have come in large numbers since in the pre-oil days. But we can't be quite sure about that because fee does exist in Yemeni Arabic as well. 
uh, as an existential. But in any case, it seems to be, uh, she, or she seems to be uh, uh, reducing it, be, uh, be, uh, facing less redu uh, uh, reduced usage in the modern era. And I actually had a conversation with a, a student who was actually put in touch with me by the Sharjah Museums Authority, who told me that his grandfather never said fi as an existential and always said she. But my students also and my research assistants have, and I also was noticing this well before I even started working with the Sharjah Museum Authority uh, transcriptions, that she is negated more often than it is used in the affirmative. And my students have told me that. And the Sharjah Museum oral histories actually confirm that. Because we see that she is used as an affirmative existential, actually only six times in the entire transcriptions. That's about 15% of all usages. And fee is used 34 uh, times or 85% of usages. Mache, on the other hand, is used 72% of the time. So to negate an existential pre uh, predication, uh, you, you're much more often to find it being used mache instead of mafi, which is only 32 times uh, in number or 26% of the usages. And that in itself seems to uh, uh, indicate that there is a language ch change in process. All right, but this is actually used for other reasons as well. Not just in this dialect, but in other, variously across other Arabic dialects throughout the Arabophone world. And one of them, there's always some confusion about what we should call it. And I used to call it a partitive after um, Cowell's uh, definition of it in Syrian Arabic. Uh, and uh, Harrell, when he talks about it in Moroccan Arabic, calls it an indefinite article. But you find it here in this part of the world as well, although not nearly as often as you find it in other dialects as well. So here we have it. Igulun kanu shi mu'atanin. Fi mu'atanin wa mu'atanet. So here it does not mean there are countrymen. It means they were some country, some you know, they, they some unspecified group of countrymen, Mawatanin, and it's used like that in other dialects as well. And the abbreviation here QTV means quantitative. It's also used in the, uh, probably from the same conceptualization to mean either or. And this has been documented in Yemeni Arabic by Janet Watson. Uh, and it's been documented by me in uh, Egyptian Arabic. And uh, it's been documented without its being identified as such in Syrian Arabic. But you get it here too. Gawarib, bu garibain. Oops, sorry about that. She bu markabain. She bu markab. So boats. He's the owner of boats. Either the owner of two boats or the owner of a boat. And here, pos means possessive. And this is abu in its possessive sense, not the father of. OK, and it's also used to pose a, a what's called a polar question. In other words, a yes, no question. She isma sug sogar is its name. And I, I say that this probably is conceived to mean is it or is it that? So we might uh, gloss this as, is it that its name is Sugsakar? And the answer was yes. Oh, it was hey, actually. Let me close this window. There's a construction site outside. I thought they'd all left. Notice that here, the same question comes at the end of the, of the utterance. And this is the way it usually appears in most dialects, uh, it appears a lot in Lebanese dialects, in Levantine dialects in general. There's a question mark she that occurs at the end of the sentence. So here's another one. But did Zakar Asami al Khayul she? And it's like, it's, I think that here it means something like, you do not remember the name of the horses, is it? Is it that you do not? Now, uh, the reason I'm showing this map again is that. When we have it at the beginning of the sentence or the end of the sentence, Holes has documented it at the beginning and the end of sentences in Omani Arabic, at the end of the beginning and end of questions, 
in Omani Arabic and in Yemeni Arabic, as far as any of the documentation I've seen, it's always at the beginning of the, the, the question. So we have there another climb that goes from here to here. And it's sometimes used in Bahrain as well, it holds documents it there, but it's always at the end of the, the, the question. So there's a climb, as I say, from here to there. It's beginning of the sentence, beginning and end of the sentence, end of the sentence, or end of the question. Let's go on. Oops, I missed something. Missed a slide. Here we go. Now, what I want to talk about now is, um, it turns out from some work that I've done recently, uh, I happen to have been in Dhofar at the beginning of the year, right before the pandemic came. Um, uh, and I was aware that modern South Arabian languages have a similar particle that is pronounced like this, she, not she, but very close. It's called a lateral fricative or lateral sibilant, sorry. Uh, and there have been documents, documentations of e even the same uh, particle as pronounced as she, and there's been she and a few others. But I, I happen to be in uh, Dhofar investigating Mehri, which is the largest of the modern South Arabian languages. And Mehri, for the most part, seems to have she. And it turns out that all of the features of this, what I now am calling a grammatical she, multifunctional grammatical she and she, works in exactly the same way. And there is, reason, there is some speculation that South Arabian languages were spoken in this entire area pre in the pre-Islamic era. Now that doesn't necessarily mean modern South Ara Arabian languages, although this same researcher, Yule, who's an archeologist, thinks that perhaps modern South Arabian languages shouldn't be called that at all because they may be older than old South Arabian. What that gives us is a chance of proximity between Arabic speakers and modern South Arabian speakers pre in the pre-Islamic era. And let us look how it works in Mehri. These are some examples of a paper that I've just submitted to Journal of Semitic Studies. And these come from uh, work that I was doing uh, in January. All right, so look, we find an existential she, she or she actually, in uh, Mehri. We also have the quantitative in both ways. She kem she makon al shikar barki. Do you have some place I might hide in? This actually is from uh, Watson's latest textbook about Mahri. You see it uh, in the either or that I put, showed you in Arabic. They cut the meat into many strips, either long or short. And it also occurs as a polar interrogative, although in the data that I have, it's not very often, but it does appear. Now, what I am trying to say is that um, what I think after uh, examining this for a while is that this particular grammatical particle in Arabic is probably borrowed from South Arabian languages even up to perhaps the meaning of the word thing, because it do does exist in Mahri and other South Arabian languages to mean thing as well. Although in the data that I was collecting, it's used far more often in the other, uh, well, depending on how you count them, but it, as le at least as often in the other grammatical functions, mostly uh, existential, as it's used to mean thing. And sometimes when it's used to mean thing, it seems like it's probably a borrowing from Arabic, a, a back into Mahri. So the question then becomes, how did these, this grammatical she that is used in all kinds of other ways, except as an existential in other dialects of Arabic, how did that happen? And Holes gives us the answer to that, and I tend to agree with him. 
that when you look at these bundle of dialects, the uh, bundle of features that all the dialects, all of these dialects in the map that I've showed you before, uh, they, you find them in this bundle of dialects only or scattered variously throughout the Arabic, uh, the, the Arabic world, the Arabophone world. And he says that these must have been come from a single source, which would have been Southern Arabia and spread by the later diaspora, which begins around 640 AD. So we have some time for discussion. And again, I must give my thanks to the Sharjah Museum's authority because they have made this priceless resource available to me and to other, I'm sure other dialectologists could work with it as well, just by filling out a request, uh, research request form. And here is the, here are the references. There are a lot of them, sorry, so it's a bit crowded, but the, the um, talk is being recorded, so you can always refer back to these later. And I thank you very much for your patience. And I'm thrilled that you're all interested in the dialects of the Emirates. And let's hope for much better things from the younger researchers who are on a, on a, a lifetime of discovery. Thank you very much, David. This was extremely interesting. It was really, really thought provoking, especially this last thought provoking hypothesis about a South Arabian origin of uh, not only existential shay she, but also all those other grammatical functions that you mentioned. I will use my uh, privilege as the host for this conference to begin with questions. And meanwhile, of course, everybody here can prepare questions. I will give you, um, I will open your mics a little later. My first question is not a question in dialectology at all. It's uh, about those recordings of the Sharjah Museum. Are, are they used for all the history research as well? Are you a team working on those recordings, um, some of you being uh, dialectologists, well, you are the uh, Arabist and dialectologist working on those recordings. Are they also going to be maybe later published? Uh, is there any plan for uh, a publishing of all those recordings uh, to be used by historians in terms of oral history? Uh, and why is there um, such a problem with um, actually giving full access and possibility of copying the audio uh, of it. Have they been digitalized? Is there, um, is there any plan to have it published? Because this would also be a tremendous resource on the one hand for historians and, and on the other hand for uh, linguists and dialectologists. Well, I'm glad you, uh, you asked that question because I had intended to say, and I forgot to say that the recordings were all conducted between uh, 2008 and 2010. And they are in digital format. When I was listening to them, they were on a computer that's housed in the library at the, uh, the uh, Sharjah Museum's authority offices. And so they, you know, they're not tape recorders. I don't know how they were recorded to begin with, but they are also very high quality. Well, there's one where there's a lot of construction noise going on because they're going around the, uh, while the, the talk is being uh, the, uh, recorded or the, the, the interview is being recorded, they're going around the construction site of Al Hessen, uh, but then they decide that they better move to a quieter place. Um, and at the time, I really don't think that there was a di any dialectologist who was working with them. It was simply uh, oral historians with, with training in, in how to co conduct research or how to conduct these interviews. And they, I must say, they did a, just a phenomenal job of everything. The, the way they conducted the in interviews were, were thoroughly professional. Um, it, for a dialectologist to have access to that, uh, that, that native speakers of the dialect in, uh, in question conducted without there being any dialectologist anywhere around is a wonderful thing because that completely takes out the uh, observer's paradox, which is you want to observe people using their natural language, but as soon as you start observing them, they may change their natural language. So that is just a, a wonderful resource. The, also, the transcription itself is, I was just, first of all, I was delighted to find that it was transcribed because when I 
first heard of them, I thought, okay, so I've got a large job in front of me to transcribe these recordings. But then they came, they, when I met with uh, Fatma the first day, she just brought them out. And, well, she gave me the files. She didn't bring them out physically. She said, here are the, here are the transcripts. And I was delighted. And I was also delighted to find that the, when the, the, uh, the, the researchers were transcribing it, they were not affected by their knowledge of fosha, which is a, always a danger. You, you tend to want to correct what's being said for the spelling. And you may have known, those of you who can read Arabic and everyone I saw, except perhaps G. Um, uh, so everyone I saw uh, joining at the beginning can read Arabic. And you can see that there are some non-conventional spellings. Uh, but that for, for a, a dialectologist, that's, that's a good thing because you can see that like now, when I'm not, I don't have access to the recordings, I can see, when I look at the transcriptions, I can see the way the things are supposed to be pronounced, usually. Sometimes with Shea, you can't, because it can be pronounced several different ways. Like with the way the women were pronouncing Shea, I don't know how they were pronouncing it. It's just there in the, in the written in Arabic, not in transliteration. And what was the other part you asked? Oh, well, is it, is it going to be published? Would it be published either in a written form or uh, are the uh, recordings themselves going ever to be published because this would be you so know, um, I don't uh, I first of all I don't know why specifically they didn't want the recordings to leave the 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 offices of the of the Sharjah Museum's authority but I didn't dispute that um, uh, I think partly it has to do with um, pres uh, preserving uh, uh, the privacy of the individuals involved uh, m many of whom have already died, and uh, um, the in in fact, in other in order for me to get access to the recordings and the transcriptions, the families had to agree as well, and they all did agree. Although the the families of the women didn't want me listening to their voices, and I don't I don't mind that. I don't, I mean, you know, I have a, a nice understanding of the way Arab society works. That it, it just, I didn't even raise my eyebrows at it, but it did occur to me at, when preparing for the talk. And as I told you before, people started joining. I had all the transcriptions, each one, one by one. And in preparing for the, the talk, I had taken them all and made them into one document. And then I thought, well, my goodness, 353, pay, four pages. That is actually book size. And these things actually ought to be published. So I probably will approach the Sharjah Museum's authority and ask if they can be published. Obviously, uh, they'd have to be edited so the names would be taken off because the names well, it are can there. Be anonymized. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it can be, yes. Excellent. Um, okay, I had two technical questions and then it's finished uh, on my... Okay. Uh, first, about shy when it is used as an, exist as an existential. What happens when you ask, is there a thing? Uh, meaning, would you say shay shay, or is that does it trigger the use of fee if the existence is the existence of a thing? You actually see both, and I do have in in uh, in um, I think there may I there, I think there is even in the the uh, transcripts themselves one place where there's shay shay, but I've certainly uh, collected it elsewhere, and also ma shay shay. Mm -hmm. You know, okay. There is no such thing. And I've also seen ma fiche and fiche. I, yeah, I mean, you see, you see it all. Okay. Last technical question, and then yes. I will <laughs> give uh, a chance for other people actually to react to your uh, conference. It's that negation. Um, did you notice any sort? Well, actually, I still have another one. After that. <laughs> Maybe later. Maybe we should uh, let other people. Did you notice any? Um, um, alternance between mob and hab and uh is this something you would be interested in investigating and i i'm, I'm kind of um I, I don't understand where hab as a negation comes from could this also and i'm asking a question to you and other people working on on south arabian uh languages could hab as a negation also be uh some sort of a remnant of South Arabian? Actually, I don't think it is. And I have done some research with that. There is no instance of, of Hab or Hub in the, in the South, uh, the, the Sharjah Museum Authority's 
okay. uh, tapes, but I was making note of the way that, uh, MUB was pronounced because sometimes it's pronounced MUB and sometimes it's pronounced MEB. Oh, okay. Um, but I don't think that comes from modern South Arabian. I think it's very clear where that where Hobu comes from. It comes from Mahubi. Okay. And I have been I have collected other instances of of Hob, which I should also point out is used from the Yemen through the Emirates. Okay. I don't think it goes in, into uh, Bahrain. I'd have to ask Clive Holes about that. But um, there's even a Yemeni song that has, I can't remember what, what it is now, something like Hub. Tagul Hu Aadi, Bas Hub Aadi, I think is the way the lyric of the song goes, it's a Yemeni song. Okay, very interesting. <laughs> Um, Delphine Armand had a question, so uh, Delphine, you can uh, switch on your mic. Yes, uh, hi, and thank you for um, the talk. Um, I was wondering just, I don't know if it has a link or what, but uh, as the, the Aki, can it yes. have a, a link with the Spanish and the Portuguese Aki, it, which means here, do you know, or not at I all? I hadn't thought of that. I had not thought of that. No, because there is a lot of words in yeah. Spanish, in, port, uh, in also in Arabic Portugal. It's come yes. from and everything. So I, I would, maybe some there is a link or not. Well, now I'm going to look into that because the first and the first thing you'd want to do is see how is that said in the other um, Romance languages. And if it's not said that way in other Romance languages, no, then not. the first thing. You, oh well, thank you for telling me that. <laughs> then the first thing you think is perhaps it did come from Arabic. Yeah, and we know that. Uh, if you know the history of Al-Andalus, there were people that identified themselves as Yemenites in Al-Andalus. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. And thank you for the question. That's interesting. That gives me another another uh, entire uh, um, aspect of the research to look into. Yeah. Uh, I did. <laughs> Uh, Jishim, uh, I don't know who, what's the uh, complete name. Maybe Jishim, you can speak now. Thank you. I have a question, David. Thanks for the interesting talk. I have a little bit of like uh, kind of preliminary syntactic analysis of shay, you say. Um, I was wondering whether that shay could be something like free choice item, you know, similar to English any. So it, it should oh, yeah. occur in some licensing environment, but it, oh, yeah. the, the, the context can be free. Could it be? Yeah positive, negative, even actually, you know, the question. So maybe, I don't know how to, you know, drive its use of existential, you know, the context, but maybe would it be, you know, that could be the, uh, the origin. So that's why there's some relation is a pre-nominal element, you know. That may, may very well be. Um, now, of course, I'm giving an abbreviated uh, um, presentation of the day, all the data that I have, but I have written about this. I'm one of the few people who've actually written about this in, in, um, at length. Maybe the only one, and I do have data where it it can be, where it could be understood. As, in fact, as an indefinite article, a you, it could be understood as an as any. It could be understood as some and other things like that in both Mahri and in Arabic. Now. You're asking about the origin then, and the origin is still a bit unclear. I'm fairly sure now that it's probably a borrowing from South Arabian, but that doesn't tell us what, how it began in, South, in modern South Arabia. It only tells us that it came into Arabic from modern South Arabia, and that will require further work, which I may not be capable of, but there are a lot of people now, fortunately, also working in modern South Arabian languages, Lots. It's really it's, a, it's heartening to see that, and also um, impressive. So maybe they can f answer the rest of that question for you. But does lateral she or I cannot I cannot pronounce it. But does it mean thing as well in some oh, yeah. Arabian language? Oh yeah. Oh yes. Okay. I didn't I didn't mention thing because it's it's so well known in Arabic uh, that it's almost the default. Uh, in fact, it is the default explanation of anything that has to do with a grammar with a sheen in it. Okay. Um, 
since I do not see yet any other questions, I will ask, <laughs> I will take sure. this chance to ask another one. At some point, you mentioned that this particular feature, uh, it was about the infix in. Um, you, it was kind of compulsory. You always heard it in, uh, nor in the North Emirates, but it was kind of um, facultative. I'm losing my English. It, the country optional. Of, optional, exactly. Yes. It was kind of optional in uh, the South Emirates or in Abu Dhabi Emirate. Okay. My question is, is it even possible to draw an isoglossic map of the Emirates knowing, uh, or is the criteria really geographic um, in a country where the way people speak has not only to do with where they were born and where they live, but also what is their tribal origin? What is their origin in UAE? Are they um, sons and daughters of Badu who were actually dwellers of this zone of the Arabian Peninsula? Do they come, uh, do their ancestors come from what is nowadays known as Saudi Arabia or from Oman uh, or from other regions? Uh, so is it even possible to speak in terms of isoglosses in this country? Um, all right. The way, the reason why you could, you could speak in terms of geographic location of isoglosses it has to do with the settlement patterns mm -hmm. of the tribes uh, in various parts of the Emirates. And uh, when I first came to the Emirates, I heard people telling me that, oh, in fact, one of my students, uh, my student from Fujairah just the other day said, we've got a, an entirely different dialect in Fujairah, she said. And she mentioned the name of some place. She said, I don't even understand those people who from that area. And that does have to do with probably we would have, this really needs more study, but we'd have, to, uh, but it probably has to do with uh, who the tribes were who were settling in those areas, in the areas where they, where the, the, these dialects are now spoken. So yes, you could do a, a geographic uh, map of isoglosses. And in fact, one of the things I hope to do is a dialect map of the, at least the Northern Emirates. I don't know if I'm gonna get to the Southern Emirates or the Southern Emirate, if you'll excuse me. Um, now, the other thing is, yes, it do, does very much have to do with, uh, or it seems clear that it has to do with the settlement patterns of people who were here when the Bedou migrated in from Nejd, or maybe even closer to, than Nejd. Uh, and um, uh, Clive Hall speaks of this a lot. He's spoken of it over and over again and written about it over and over again. And the reason why we have this broken chain that he calls it, and I'm perfectly content to call it that, is that there probably was in early, the earlier era, earlier meaning before Islam, a, uh, a, a continuous, contiguous dialect area of what might be called archaic Arabic dialects all along the coast of uh, Yemen and Oman. And uh, Holes actually says, in the coasts and the valleys of Oman, and in the Emirates and all the way up to Bahrain. And in fact, he said, uh, Holes himself, Holes has been saying this more than anybody else. Uh, and I'm perfectly happy to be cor cor corroborating what he says. He says that in Bahrain, the, the tribal memories are such that they are people who have uh, eventually, uh, who did come from Yemen. And even some of the place names are, of uh, the village names are, are, are Yemeni names or these tribal names from the Yemen. So I think I answered the question. Thank you very much. Uh, Najla Kalash has a question for you now. Good. Uh, Hello, yes. Najla. Hello, David, how are you? Very oh, nice happy to, to see to hear you. From you. Yes, me too. And thank you also, Professor Lagrange. I have um, a question. It was a very interesting talk, especially for me that I'm working on uh, texts from young, uh, Emirati women, I would like to ask you uh, which is the most common negative particle uh, that you find in the transcriptions used before a noun or adjective? It's usually meb or mob. Meb. 
Mob or mob, okay. Anything, anything What do you there? find? Well, sometimes uh, mad. I, I find almost everything because uh, yeah, these, these young girls, uh, their age is about 20, 25 years old, uh, talk with a very kind of mixed uh, variety so they use also mesh, mob, right. ma, everything yes. and also sometimes they mix uh, with English so it would be very very interesting for me just to compare uh, the, the the older variety with the newest one so thank you very much. I'm uh, I'm sure yeah. I've looked through I'm sure I've looked through the the transcriptions before to find mesh but yeah. I, I didn't think of that when I was preparing for the talk but I will do that I'm, yeah. I, but I'm positive that it's mostly mob or map. Uh, but mish is used, and it seems to be used a lot more. And again, I've had uh, corroboration from native speakers of Emirati dialects who say that it wasn't used that way before. That it's come from it's come from outside. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Certainly. Thank you very much. I uh, that, that's a good question. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Is there a last question for uh, Professor Wilson? Then, if it is not the okay, case, oh, Delphine Armand is thanking you. So, uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, for My the pleasure. I had a great deal. Talk. And uh, we will, we certainly want to see something coming out of print soon. Uh, we would really love to see um, those recordings, even if under the transcription um, in Arabic, printed in Arabic soon. Um, it's, uh, I'll, I'll, excuse me, there's uh, Ahmed is sending something. Maybe Ahmed wants to, um, I'm, giving him the mic. Ahmed, do you want to pose your question? You can speak now. Oh, it says his mic's not working. Um, oh, your no, mic is not working. So yeah, but immigration started from Yemen to various places in all directions in pre-Islamic Arabia since the Kashkasha is mainly uh, as Kepran's che is mainly a feature in the dialects of the tribes of Tamim, Bakr, Asad, Salim, and there were documented wars between Tamim and Bakr. Uh, it seems to me that K uh, becoming She or Che through contact between them. Okay, now I uh, agree with everything he says except for the part about Shah. And Holes has worked on this before too, and he says that uh, he he supposes that. Sha is probably from contact with South Arabian languages. Yeah. So it started as Kesha, Kesh yes, but it became Sheen through contact with modern South, uh, with South Arabian languages. Um, uh, and the, uh, it, this would be really hard to prove, except that he showed, I didn't do it, but I have, all, I have if, you, if you go to his 2018 article, he's got a map that shows the spread of the infix noon and a map that shows the spread of Sha as opposed to Sha. And you can see that Sha goes all the way up to the borders of uh, the Emirates. And in fact, one of the examples I gave, was, the first example of infix noon was when he said, Shefina tal omrich. Sorry, he said tal omrish. And then uh, Holes also plots on that map um, the modern South Arabian languages use of sh, and that actually seems to correspond, at least in in the southern Arabia, the the far south of Arabia, with the the uh, the pronoun pronunciation of the sheen, which I think Ahmed can correct me if I if I'm wrong, but I think that's called a shen shena. So it wouldn't be de-Africation of Che, or Che wouldn't be Africation of Che. It would be two separate, or possibly two separate phenomenons. Well, the Africation of, of Kaf is actually well attested uh, in a lot of other dialects. And so that probably is just a natural sound change. The Che, you know, we'd really have to ex uh, examine it much more to see whether it was a de-Africation or, or further de-Africation uh, de of it. 
Thank you very much for the. Um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this collection of books. Uh, um, oh yeah, the, which was uh, published in Abu Dhabi. It was Al Imarat fi Zakirat Abnaiha. Uh, it's in three volumes made by yes. Abdullah Abdurrahman, uh, which are uh, also testimonies of old inhabitants of the Emirates and of Abu Dhabi, but unfortunately translated into standard Arabic and not as colloquial Arabic. I wonder if you had any uh, interest of getting in touch with uh, the teams that did this in Abu Dhabi and see if there were any traces, if there were recordings in the first place, traces of recordings so that such a work that has been conducted in um, Sharjah may, might, has, might as well have been conducted elsewhere in the Emirates and would provide us with other recordings and other material for dialectologists. Well, I would be, um, and I'm also waiting for the National Archives, and maybe these are the same materials, but the, the, the um, United Arab Emirates Archives has 700 recordings. And there is also a, a, uh, a, an organization in Sharjah, I can't remember what it's called now, that has a series of recordings called Treasures of the Northern Emirates. And I'm waiting for these all to become available. And they, it's been more than a year, and they're still not available. But, but maybe before I, I retire, I'll be able to get access to them. So yes, I'm always interested in those things. Always well, I'm sure that there are, there's going to be work for generations and generations oh, yes. of linguists yes. and dialectologists when all those recordings yes. are made available. And fortunately, we have a much. younger generation coming up that, are, that, are, that is looking into Emirati Arabic. Oh, yes. And I thank you, too. I thank you. This is, it was a delight for me to prepare for the talk because it caused me to go back over the data again and become re-enthusiastic re re once again about them. Thank you. Uh, we will meet again next yes. month for a new uh, Jalsa, for uh, a new Diwan as Sorbonne and Sifas. And the talk uh, next month will not be in linguistics and the electology. Uh, the topic will be the city of Dubai from a human geography point of view, oh, from a sociology point of view, and uh, it will be with Delphine El-Karawi uh, from Inalco. Thank you very much, everybody.